We had the two, we had the story of the two who went to Emmaus. They went back to their hometown and we read about that time when Jesus, that the risen Lord, had appeared to them in another form. And um and then we also, as we, we, we see that, they, that, that the Lord Jesus was revealed when they uh, broke bread and it says their eyes were opened. And we're going we're gonna to carry on that story pretty much from that point. So we're going to start by reading. And we're going we're gonna to have to go around the four Gospels again because uh, it puts the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Let's read, we'll start off in, from the book of Mark. So the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, and um, sorry, we're going to look uh, read verses 9 to 11, please. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. So we're just going to start off our story with there's this, there's this spirit of disbelief amongst the disciples. And the crucifixion of Jesus was a real stumbling block for the disciples of Jesus. Their expectations of a Messiah who would conquer the Romans, disappeared when they nailed him on the cross. The disciples were disillusioned in their Lord, who had now been relegated to just a great prophet. They did not understand the scriptures that taught that the Messiah had to suffer first before entering into his glory. And so for a few days, we have a group of unbelieving disciples. And even though Jesus told them directly on several occasions that he was going to suffer, he was going to die and rise again the third day, they did not believe what the Lord would, that the Lord would rise from the dead. And then they hear the report of the women who saw the open tomb and of the angels uh, telling them that Jesus is alive. They, the disciples hear the report of Mary Magdalene saying that she had actually spoken to the risen Lord. And sometime in that day, the disciples had gathered together in a house in Jerusalem. The rumours of these reports were spreading from disciple to to disciple, and it seems like they got together to discuss what was going on. And according to John's gospel, they locked the door for fear of the Jews. At some point in that day, the apostle Peter comes running in to tell them that Jesus had appeared to him personally. Yet there were still doubts. Now, you would think that the testimony of the women plus Peter would convince the others, but no, their hearts were filled with disbelief. Imagine the accusations of delusion and doubt. You know, you're imagining things that I'll be saying. Your your mind's playing tricks on you. Have you been drinking, perhaps? And then late that evening comes a frantic knock on the door. The two that had uh, the two that were, went to Emmaus, who had earlier been with the disciples and who, who themselves had heard the reports of the women seeing angels, they left. They they left for their journey back to Emmaus, and and they saw the risen Lord who had appeared to them, and now they return back to Jerusalem, knock on the door, and report that they had now seen the risen Lord in their own home. They left the washing up behind. They raced back to Jerusalem in the dark to share this exciting news. And they, so they wanted to tell the disciples this news firsthand. But when they shared their exciting news, they were met with a wall of doubt. Um, Dan, could you please read verses 12 to 13? Thanks. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Right, thanks. So, so even these two who had, who had come, with, had come all the way back to tell the disciples that they, they had seen Jesus, the disciples didn't even believe their report. I mean, they had seen him firsthand. 
um, so there was no trust between the disciples, so much so that when Jesus does finally appear to the group, he says these words. If you can, In verse 14, he, it says that he later appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And so in no uncertain terms, the, the risen Jesus rebukes his disciples for not believing, not only for not believing his own words, but the words of other faithful believers. The, their disciples' hearts were hardened just like Pharaoh and just like the chief priests. And now we might be thinking, oh, what foolish disciples. How could they not believe? But maybe just take that story 2,000 years into the future. Let's say I, I gave a phone call to Brother Stuart, the recorder, uh, and saying, look, there's, there's, a, there's an angel at the door and, 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 and he's telling us that Jesus had returned and, and he sends an email to everyone. Would you believe that email? Would you believe me? You know, would, would you believe if, if, if another brother or sister had said that? Um, you know, because we, we, we theorise the return of, 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 of Jesus Christ, but do we really believe it? Or, you know, would you think, oh, oh zamo has gone mad or something like that? Just, just, just some food for thought there. But their arguments and doubts were only going to be short-lived because there was still yet one more visitor to come. And now we're going to turn to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Um, if uh, Brother Dan, we can read Luke 24, uh, verses 36 to 37 please and as they thus spake jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them peace be unto you but they were terrified and affrighted and they, and supposed that they had seen a spirit yeah thanks and so the disciples couldn't believe it this can't be jesus they thought it's a spirit they were terrified or frightened and according to John, the door was locked and, and now suddenly this person is inside the room. And it says there in the, in the uh, parallel record in John, it says the same day at evening, this is on the screen there, the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. And, you know, so the disciples did not know what to think. Were they hallucinating? Was someone playing a trick? And the immortal Lord greets them with the words, peace to you. Now, why would Jesus open with those words, peace to you? It's probably because they're in the midst of a heated argument. They were arguing over the eyewitness accounts. Were they true or were they imagination? imagination? The two from Emmaus had come and were telling them that and they weren't believing. And there would have been some heated arguments happening there. And so Jesus appears right in the heat of that. His appearance came at the right time. But they were terrified. So Jesus says words to calm their fears. And um, if you can carry on with, by reading verses 38 to 40, please. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And so to prove it to, his, to the disciples, Jesus, Jesus um, showed them his hands and feet. He was showing them the imprints from the nails when he was crucified. And you, I, can, I can imagine, you know, Cleopas, you know, the, the two that were from Emmaus and, his, and, you know, and the fellow disciple, whoever that may be, was, you know, they'd be thinking, see, we told you so. And the, the risen Lord then in, invites them to handle him and see and you might remember back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they thought to themselves, oh, we better not, better not touch the tree of life lest we die. But here we have the tree of life inviting his disciples to touch and to handle him. And, he, and, and Jesus uses the words flesh and bones. And 
doesn't that remind us of the the time when the first Adam, when after he was raised from a deep sleep, he said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I actually, I actually wonder who was brave enough to be the first one to handle the risen Lord. Was it Mary perhaps? Was it Peter? Or was it Cleopas and his wife? Just an interesting thought there. And so... Um, if you can carry on with that reading of verses 41 to 42, please. Actually, sorry, 41 to 43, if you don't mind. And while they were yet believed, and while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And so at this point, the disciples are struggling to believe what they were seeing and hearing. And it, it says that they didn't believe for joy. And in other words, it's too good to be true. And so Jesus sits down at the table and asks them for food. And now he eats some fish and honeycomb while all of them are waiting. I think that's the, uh, that's the foundation for, a th for Thai food there, fish and honeycomb. Yes, it's pretty much what we had for dinner. <laughs> so, um, and but but now this this the, the the risen Lord, this immortal Jesus, now eating is now going to seal their belief. And you know, th this guy was real. This was no figment of the imagination. It was no spirit. It was the risen Lord. He is alive. Um, the Book of Acts opens up by saying that Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs and here was an infallible proof and in the book of acts acts 10 the, the quote on the screen there says him god raised up on the third day and showed him openly not to all the people but to witnesses chosen before by god even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead and that, and that reminds us of the story of joseph and his brothers how that he ate in their presence and, and then was revealed to them. You know, at first they couldn't believe that their brother was alive, but, but after that they were all changed men. And, you know, this image of the resurrected Lord gives us a bit of an insight into immortality, what it's like to be immortal. You know, the, the risen Lord was able to either walk through doors or to teleport from one place to another. He now possessed a body that could no longer die or grow weak. He had flesh and bones that people could touch and feel. And yet he was still able to eat and drink with his friends and have wonderful fellowship with them. So as mortals, as mortals, we eating and drink is a necessity to keep us alive. But, but eating and drinking also gives us pleasure. And it would certainly appear that as an immortal, God will still give us the pleasure of enjoying food. You know, so what a wonderful privilege uh, that would be, to be immortal in God's kingdom. So now what we're going to do is we're going to change to the Gospel of John. We're going to, and we, I think we're going to stay here for a little bit. Uh, so John chapter 20, please. If we can go over to John chapter 20. And... It just fills a li little bit more detail here. So John 20, and i get you to read verses 24 to 25. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. All right, so, so verse 24 tells us that Thomas was not present when the risen Lord had first appeared to the disciples. But when he eventually does rejoin the disciples, he now has more than just the women saying that he had, they had seen Jesus. Uh, the other apostles, all of them tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. He really is alive. It, the, the, the reports are true. We've seen the marks in his hands and his feet. It really is him. 
But Thomas absolutely refuses to believe them. And, and, and this is what he says. He says, unless I see in his hands the print of his nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his size, I am not going to believe. Yeah, like I'm going to be pretty harsh here. So what arrogance, what distrust and what unbelief. How could he not believe what his friends were telling him? Surely they all couldn't be deluded. And so the question needs to be asked, why was Thomas absent from the group of disciples when Jesus first appeared to them? Well, we're not told. But one suggestion is that he had just, Thomas had had a gutful of the conversation and the arguments that had taken place on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, the stories of angels at the tomb, the story of Mary seeing Jesus were all too much. And I reckon he walked out that day. And whilst we can't prove that in any way, just the, the, the strength of his words um, just showed that this man had a spirit of disbelief. And it was a, and you know, this spirit of disbelief would have been a real stumbling block to the fellowship of the disciples. Have, have you come across people like that who just don't want to believe? They come up with these big ultimatums like, like Thomas, uh, uh, you know, unless I see Jesus, you know, myself, the you know, Jesus appearing to me in a, in a vision, I'm not going to believe. But it wasn't going to be long before Thomas was going to be proven wrong and truth prevailed. Let's read, um, Dan, if we can read verses 26 through to 29, please. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither my finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So this time, it's, it's, it's a second time, it says eight days later, once again the risen Lord appears uh, to them while the doors were shut. But, so, but Thomas is with them this time, and, and, and the Lord looks straight at Thomas, goes straight to him and tells him to get his finger and place it in his hands and to reach out his hand and, and put it in his side. Can you imagine how awful Thomas is feeling right at this moment? I can tell you now, he would not have wanted to actually touch the holes in the Lord's hands or touch his side. He, he had seen the risen Lord for himself. I, I just I can't imagine the shame and embarrassment he felt in the presence of the Lord. Uh, and, and, and his response, you know, his response is, he says, my Lord and my God. This was an eye-opening moment for Thomas. Seeing was believing for this man. Thomas would have been on his knees before the king. And I bet you were, there were a few I told you so's said to Thomas that day. And, and, and the Lord says to Thomas, just simple advice, do not be unbelieving but believing. And what the Lord says next is a wonderful statement for all future generations of believers. And this is what he says to Thomas. He says, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And, and, and brothers and sisters, we are of those whom Jesus is talking about. We believe in the risen Christ. We, we believe that he died and rose again and reigns in heaven next to his Father. And we believe that he will return and take us to himself to reign with him in God's kingdom on earth. What a blessing it is to believe in an invisible God and an invisible Christ. One day, brothers and sisters, one day our eyes will confirm our faith. And that expression of Thomas that he spoke, it, it's not an expression that uh, the one that proclaims a trinity. 
Rather, it was an expression of awesome wonder before the Lord Jesus and God the Father. The, the, the resurrection of Christ was now real in the eyes of Thomas. There was no doubt at all now that Jesus was the Messiah. But, you know, that enlightenment of Thomas is just a shadow of things to come. We're just going to leave John. I just might get you to put a bookmark here in John um, and we'll come, come back over to Zechariah chapter 13 because we're going to see a prophecy of where um, this phrase is used or, sorry, where this phrase will be used in the future. Come over to Zechariah chapter 13. And if we can read Zechariah 13, verses 8 to 9, please. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They, will, they shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Yeah, thanks. And so, you know, soon there's going to be a time when the Jewish nation will recognise the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. At a time of great despair when two-thirds of the Jews are killed. The saviour of the nation will defeat the enemies of Israel and proclaim to be their king. Zechariah 12 verse 10, if you just glance over it, actually, it says there that then they will look upon me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And so it will be, it, it's, it, it would say what a moment that will be. It's going to be a great time of mourning for the Jews as they lament what their nation did to the Son of God. And it's going to be the story of Joseph and his brothers all over again. And it's actually going to be the story of Jesus and Thomas all over again. So you might be thinking, well, what's the connection there with Thomas? Well, what Brother Dan just read in verse 9, it's the expression there where it says in verse 9, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. That's the expression that Thomas used, my Lord and my God. It's, it's, and, and what Thomas said is going to be echoed by the Jewish nation that had once rejected, uh, who had disbelieved that Jesus was the risen Christ. And so we cannot wait for that moment of repentance. And I bet your brother Glenn is saying it's uh, that, that, that uh, slide there, the picture on there looks very familiar because that's uh, brother Glenn's um, Zoom, Zoom screen. And so it's, uh, it's also one of my favourite pictures too, Glenn. Someone, someone recognises what's going to happen in the future very accurately actually. All right, so um, it's, let's turn back to John now. So we come, we, we'll, we'll carry on the story in, uh, in John chapter 21. And uh, hopefully you've kept a bookmark there. John 21, and we're going to read verses 1 to 3. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night, they caught nothing. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And and just so for those of you who weren't aware of this, um, John, the, the Gospel of John actually ends at the end of verse, uh, verse uh, sorry, the, at the end of, the Gospel of John actually ends at the end of chapter 20, right? That's when the, the, the actual Gospel ends. But John 21 forms like an epilogue 
to the story. It's an extra chapter that that that, that John sort of put in there, um, just to highlight a, a few things. And so, so in the story, so some days later, many of the disciples journeyed back to Galilee, and that would have been in anticipation of an appointment that Jesus had previously made with them. But I want you to note that this event here at the Sea of Galilee is not that appointment, right? When Jesus says, I'm going to meet you in Galilee, this is not that appointment. This this sort of caught them by surprise. This is a separate and unexpected appearance of Jesus to just some of his disciples. And so one day Peter decides to go fishing and some of the disciples join him. And the, the, the apostles who are with him are Thomas, James, John, and Nathaniel. So that's five apostles in total. And it, it says there were two other disciples with there with them. So disciples of the Lord, probably not apostles. Right? Um, so the record says there that they caught nothing. And after being out all night, you know, the, these tired disciples head back to the shore to, in, the, in the early morning light. And, and as they're coming to shore, they see a man in the distance, but they, but they don't actually recognise him. And so we'll carry on from reading verses 4 to 6, please, Dan. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Yeah, so this, this man yells out and he says, Hey, children, do you have any food? And that's a bit of a weird question, isn't it? I mean, he's calling them children. The word actually means children. And, and in response, they answer no. Probably They're probably thinking, well, the man wants something to eat. But the man wasn't asking for himself. This, this man was concerned for his children. And the man then says, he says, look, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some food. And like, you know, imagine men like Peter, James and John, you know, these are professional Galilean fishermen. These men would know the waters of Galilee like the back of their hand. They would know where the fish would be. And if they couldn't catch anything, well, nobody would. Who's this guy giving us this advice? But regardless, they listened to the advice of this solitary man. Maybe did the words of this strange man remind them of something that happened earlier in Jesus' ministry? Did they now suspect that this man was just a bit more than, than a stranger? And so they let down their nets on the right side of the boat and zim, zim, zalabim. There were so many fish in the net that they were unable to draw the net in due to the multitude of fish. If we can just read verses 7 to 9. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a, a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. So upon, you know, so, so at this point, John, John says to Peter, it is the Lord. And John had no doubts who this strange man was now. And upon hearing that, Peter puts on his fishing coat, he dives into the water and he, he actually leaves the others struggling to, to, uh, to drag in the net full of fish to the land. He, he just leaves them behind. And, and when they got to land, they see the man and the fire of coals and the fish cooking away and there's also some bread. If we could just read verses 10 to 14, please, Dan. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up 
and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153, and for all there were so many, yet was the net not broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This now is the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Okay, so so Peter comes to shore and Peter tells, sorry, Jesus tells Peter to go and bring some of the fish to him. And at once Peter goes back in the water and he drags the net onto the land. And then and, and Jesus invites all the disciples, all those, those, those disciples on the boat, to join him for breakfast. And so we, we have, he's, he's, he's got some fish and some bread. And so, um, you know, so we have a scenario here where bread and fish, and, uh, fish are eaten in the same meal. Um, does that remind you of something perhaps? Perhaps the, does that remind you of the, the feeding of the 5,000? Remember that it started with, the feeding of the 5,000 started with five loaves and two fish. And I don't know, is it a coincidence here that we have five apostles and two disciples at this meal? You know, the, the spreading of the gospel was going to commence with this small gathering of disciples, which would end up with the catching of a large number of great fish. And so you might think, what is the significance of the 153 fish? Um, and so I can't see what slide number it is on the screen. Can anyone tell me? <laughs> um, I've got stuff covering it all. 13. 13. That's exactly where I want to be. Um, so there's no doubt that the catch of great fish represents the ingathering of the saints into the kingdom. Yet John specifically mentions uh, the number of fish and he also mentions that the event happened at the Sea of Tiberias. He doesn't, he doesn't say it's at the Sea of Galilee. He says he calls it the Sea of Tiberias. Now, that's the Roman name for the Sea of Galilee. And that's, he, this, is a deliberate, this is deliberate to show that this event in the life of the disciples was a parable of what had to become, what they had to become. They had to become fishers of men. So the mention of the Jewish name of the Sea of Galilee in this story shows that this final catch is going to be made up of both Jews and Gentiles. But why the number 153? You know, John specifically mentions this number of fish caught here. What's the significance? And look, there have been so many suggestions for this and you know, trying to work out conclusively which is the right one um, is, is very difficult, actually. But what I'm going to offer you now are just a few suggestions. So the first one is this, and um, it's, it says he, it, so it says specifically that Peter was the one who personally brought the fish to land. It's likely that the other disciples had a hand in that, but it's that Peter actually, when Jesus says, go get me some fish, Peter went back in the water to go get some fish. And later on in this chapter, Jesus addresses Peter as Simon, son of Jonah. And according to um, this commentator, Arthur Peake, in his commentary of the Bible, he says that the Hebrew numerical value of the name Simon is 118. And the name Jonah is, is, is 35. And you add the two, Simon and Jonah, you get 153. And so here, um, Peter, who is to become the, the fisher of men, he brings forth a catch of 153 fish, representing the gathering of Jews and Gentiles. Yeah, that one's okay. Um, I can live with that. that. That sounds all right to me. But, you know, um, as we teach at Bible seminars, and I I think in this week's Bible, we, we start the Bible seminars, and I think this is one of the lessons we teach this, this very first uh, week, is we, say, we teach that let the Bible interpret itself. I mean, 
I don't know the the numerical value of Hebrew words. I'm, how am I supposed to work that out? So only it's only because I read that in a commentary. So we must ask ourselves: Is there any way anywhere else in the Bible that mentions the number one hundred and fifty three? Well, as it turns out, there is one place in the Bible that does, or one other place in the Bible. And here it is here. It's the only other time the number 153 occurs in the Bible is in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 17. And for the sake of time, I just popped it on the screen there. And it says there, it says, So Solomon numbered all the men that were sojourners, and they were found to be 153,000. And six hundred, and so so the context of this is the building of the temple in Jerusalem at the time of Solomon, and it took one hundred and fifty three thousand six hundred Gentiles to build the temple that God had designed. Well, you know, God is building another temple today. It's it's not a temple made with hands, but it's a house for His name. It's and a hundred and and so, it, it's you know there's a there's this verse here in, in Ephesians two. It says, "You are that's you that's brothers and sisters. You are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, in whom the whole building grows into a holy temple, in the Lord." And we are building on that, brothers and sisters. We're building, it, 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 as Gentiles, we're building upon in the building of the, the household of God. And so 153 represents the ingathering of people from all over the world who are called to be saints in the kingdom of God. And for those of you who are mathematically minded, here's just one more little fun fact. 153 has some amazing mathematical properties. It's a 153 is a triangular number. Now, what do I mean by a triangular number? Well, if you have a look at some of these examples on the screen here, you can see the, say, for example, the number 10 is a triangular number. You've got one, then you've got two, then you've got three, and then four. And if you add them all up, you get 10. Same with 15. You've got 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, and you end up with 15. Well, if you have a look at this, uh, uh, 153 is also a triangular number. It, it's, uh, it, it forms the end of that, that triangle. And so you think, well, what's so amazing about that? After all, look, there's a, there's a number of other triangular numbers, as you can see, in that triangle. But do you also notice here that the number 120 is a triangular number? You think, what's that got to do with the price of fish? No pun intended. Um, well, that's the, if you may remember, 120 is the, is the number of disciples that were in the upper room at Pentecost. Think, okay, well, that's interesting. But, you know, also, I haven't got it on the screen, but the number 276 is a triangular number. What's 276? Well, that's the number of people who were on the ship with the Apostle Paul. The, the, the book of Acts specifically mentions that number. And would you believe that the other, another triangular number is the number 666? That's a triangular number. And you think to yourself, what's the chances of all those numbers that are mentioned in the New Testament being triangular? And that's because the scriptures were written by a wonderful number. Anyway, take it or leave it. Just a little bit of mathematical uh, interest there. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, hang on, this miraculous story of catching fish uh, that, that rings a bell, hasn't? Didn't that happen earlier in one of the Gospels? Well, if you're thinking that, you're not wrong, because there is a similar story in Luke chapter five, where the disciples were fishing and had caught nothing, and Jesus then tells them to let down their nets, and they caught they caught this great number of fish. So th there's obviously a connection here, and so you think, what's the significance of these miracles? 
Well, the, the lesson of the first one, we, we, we're told that, you know, in Luke 5, that Peter, Peter is told that he needs to become a fisher of men. And so fishing, therefore, becomes a symbol of preaching the truth. The, the, the Sea of Galilee represents the sea of nations from which the disciples are called out of. And in both miracles, the disciples had been fishing in the dark and caught nothing. Now, I guess that's what it's like when we go preaching without the guidance of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's almost as if we are fishing in the dark in the hope that we're going to catch something. But when the Lord does intervene, we do catch something. And so when you compare the two stories, there are, there are many similarities between the two stories. But there's also some significant differences. So I've got them listed here on the screen. So in Luke 5, Jesus is called the teacher, whereas in John 21, Jesus is known as the Lord. In Luke 5, Jesus is in the sea. Remember, he's actually in the boat. And in John 21, Jesus is on the land. You think, oh, that's, what's, that's different. In Luke 5, there were two boats. In John 21, there was one boat. In Luke 5, Jesus says, let down your nets. In John 21, he specifically says, cast the net on the right side of the boat. Um, in Luke 5, they went out into the deep. This time in John 21, they were, they were close to shore. In Luke 5, fish were taken onto the boat. In John 21, fish were taken to the shore. In Luke 5, it says the nets broke. In John 21, the nets remained intact. In Luke 5, the boats began to sink. But in John 21, the boat stayed afloat. And in Luke 5, it mentions this great number of fish. It doesn't say how many. It's just there's a multitude of fish. In John 21, it's called 153 great fish. And so to summarise here, the, the first miracle represents the gathering of different kinds of fish into the boat. But on that occasion, on the, in, in Luke 5, that in that, on that first occasion, the boats began to sink. The nets broke and some of the fish would have got away. And that's what happens when the gospel is preached. A, a multitude of people come into the truth over the centuries. But sadly, and, and really sadly, it breaks their hearts. We, we know that many of them get away. They, get, they, they go through the net and they're lost in the stormy seas. But in the second miracle, the net remains intact. The boat doesn't sink. And we have a select number of fish who are taken on, the land, taken on land to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And these fish are styled great fish. These are the ones who were found on the right side of the boat. These are the fish chosen for the kingdom of God. These are the saints who are taken to the right side of the shepherd. And speaking of the shepherd, the Lord now instructs Peter about shepherding. But I can see that time has departed from us. And, you know, this story of John chapter 21, it really deserves probably about two Bible classes worth of material. I think for the sake of time, I'm going to leave this little section out uh, where Peter is, is, is instructed by the Lord. I'm just going to leave this out and we're going to carry on with the story. So we're going to come to just leave that out there and we're going to continue the story now in Matthew chapter 28. So um, Matthew 28, we're going to read... Um, Bear with me for a second. John chapter 28, we're going to read verses 16 through to 17. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. All right, so sometime after the events of John 21, the risen Lord met an assembled group of believers. 
Now, this is the meeting that the Apostle Paul refers to in, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says that after he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And so, after, so over 500 disciples assembled together at a, in a, a mountain in Galilee. And this was a prearranged meeting. And this was prearranged by the Lord himself. And the invitation and reminders of this meeting are referred to in five verses in the Gospels. And two of them are here, actually, in Matthew 28, verse 7. It says, and go quickly, tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. He is, he, and indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And also verse 10, it says, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And so, so this is the great uh, invitation to Come to Galilee. And it wasn't just the 12 who went there. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us there were 500 who went to this meeting. And so where was this mountain in Galilee? Well, we're not told. But it's probably most likely a mountain on which the Lord had preached before. And I would say it was probably where he gave the sermon on the mount. And, you know, it, it says... We, we just read there, even it's, it says that even then some doubted that it was the risen Lord. Yeah. These people, they needed a lot of convincing that Jesus was alive. I guess it's easy for us looking back and read the stories and, you know, the benef- have the, having the benefit of hindsight. But these people needed a lot of convincing. And maybe their doubt was just leading up to this meeting. Maybe that's where the doubt was. And, and maybe, maybe upon their first sighting of seeing this man in the distance, but after that meeting, their doubts would have all been erased. And again, I say, blessed are we who believe and yet have not seen. What did Jesus say to them on that occasion? Well, he would have said a lot of things, but he said this. We know he said this. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. And so the Lord told them that the Father has now put him in charge of everything. The creator of the universe has delegated authority unto the Son. And so he says, now go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And Jesus completed that statement by saying that he would be with them all the way, even to the end of the age. But there was still one more person that the risen Lord needed to personally show himself to. Can you think of who that is? Well, this is who it is. It says there, and we only learn this in Corinthians after the event, it says, after that he was seen by James. And that James there is the Lord's half-brother. So after that meeting of the 500 brethren, the Lord appears to James, his own brother in the flesh. And in the ministry of Jesus, it says his own brothers didn't believe in him. However, from this point, James is not only going to become a believer, but he's going to become one of the greatest shepherds of the, uh, the Jerusalem Ecclesia and the nation of Judea. And now we're coming to the end of the story. And I'd like us all to turn to Acts chapter 1, please. You know, it says in Acts chapter 1, it says, After his resurrection, the Lord appeared to many of the disciples. And, you know, Acts 1.3, 1 verse 3, it says, it says, To whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering, suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So for 40 days after he rose from the dead, he appeared on several occasions to different disciples. And it says there what he was preparing them, he, he was speaking of things pertaining, you know, speaking things about the kingdom of God. And we now arrive at day 40. The disciples have now returned to Jerusalem. They're in high expectation. 
In fact, it seems that they were expecting the immortal Jesus to set up the kingdom of God there and then. And in verse 6, it says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And and even then, you can see that the disciples still did not understand or, or perhaps want to understand that their Lord had to go away for a very long time. And instead, Jesus gives them the great commission, this great commission to his disciples. He says to them, look, what I want you to do is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptised will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And so Jesus gives them this great commission. And that work was to begin in Jerusalem and then spread throughout all the world. And brothers and sisters, that work is still happening today. And many of us, many of us, including my family, have heard the truth as a result of someone putting a leaflet in my mailbox. I don't know who that brother or sister or even child, put, I don't know who put that leaflet in our mailbox, but I, I, I wish I could personally thank them for it because it really it has changed my life. It's changed our lives as a family. It's changed many of your lives. Your, many of you have started with a leaflet in your mailbox. And that work must can carry on until he returns. So that's a little bit of a plug for the rest of us who haven't delivered our leaflets yet, including me. All right, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, one afternoon shift, we're going to do it tomorrow morning. So, God willing. And so, and so on day 40, the last day, Luke tells us that Jesus walked with them. To, it says there, I'll just read it on the screen there, it says, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And now it came to pass while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Acts 1 verse 9 says, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And we just saw, yeah, it, it, so, it, so it says that he was, he was taken up. And in Luke, which you see on the screen, it says that he was carried up into heaven. And I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the ascension to heaven, we always see these pictures of Jesus just sort of going up and up and up by himself. But from what we read or from what I read, it acts where it says he was taken up uh, and where it says Jesus was carried up, that's telling me that it was an angel or perhaps a group of angels who carried Jesus up. And it also says that a cloud received him. And I don't think that's just saying that he just went into a cloud and disappeared. I, think, I don't think this was an ordinary cloud of water droplets. I think this is a cloud of angels. This was a host of angels who were just waiting there, you know, ready to give the red carpet treatment to the Lord. You know, they were waiting, ready to meet the Son of God. And if you think I'm making that up, you just need a little bit of confirmation of that interpretation there. Just have a look at this prophecy here. And this is the prophecy in, um, in, in Daniel chapter 7. And it says there in Daniel 7, it says, I was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. All right, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. So it says coming with the clouds, not just clouds of the sky. Not, he didn't say going in the clouds and the sky, but it says coming with the clouds of heaven. They're the angels, brothers and sisters, and it says they, the clouds, brought him 
before God, before the Ancient of Days, before the creator of the universe. The clouds of angels were bringing the Son of God to the Father. And I'm not sure if you've given this much thought before. But this, this is perhaps the greatest moment ever in the history of the world. I just want you to imagine the moment that the Son of God first meets his Father. You know, for, Jesus was born 33 years before that. He was brought up by Joseph and Mary. And throughout his mortality on earth, Jesus got to know his father through direct and indirect communication. But they had never met. This is the moment that the family meets for the first time. Just, just take it in, brothers and sisters. Like this is this is a real emotional part of this class. This, this is this is imagine the emotional embrace of the father and son for the first time. What a what a like this, this brings me to tears. I seriously, I I I, I um I, I lost it when I put this slide together. I hope I don't lose it again. But this is the, you know, imagine the, the father just look and see his son coming up to him. And, 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 and the father, he speaks the words of Psalm 110 verse 1. And he says, son, he says, son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Brothers and sisters, I want us to go to bed tonight thinking about that thinking about that wonderful occasion where the father meets the son for the very first time. And so we are left with the disciples on the ground staring into the skies in great amazement and, sh and shock perhaps. <laughs> but they are reassured that the same Jesus would one day return. And those angels say to them, <coughs> men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who has taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Brothers and sisters, the return of Jesus Christ to the earth is the foundation of our hope. Jesus spoke parables to the disciples to inform them that he would go away to a far country for a very long time. And in that time, and though he was away, he would still be present with them as he oversees the eternal salvation of all his followers. Well, we have finally reached the end of the story of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth. The time of the Lord's work in heaven began to commence that very day that he ascended into heaven. But the Lord's work in heaven is now almost expired. It's nearly finished. And very soon we will be in the presence of the Son of God when he comes in his kingdom. And before you know it, our life as a mortal saint will be history. Before you know it, we will be the ones who will be telling stories to the mortal people in the kingdom on earth. We'll be telling them about our time as a mortal, as a saint, as a worker in the Moorbank Ecclesia. But until then, we wait. We wait in faith and we wait patiently. And as servants of our master, we continue to do the work that he's asked us to do joyfully. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus. Thanks. Thanks.